now I'd like to, uh, for a short presentation by uh, Colin Campbell Clyde, who is co founder of Restore the Fort Santa Cruz. You'll notice that Councilmember Michael Poster has joined us on the dais, so he'll be taking your questions and perhaps we can uh, impose on him for a short overview of maybe the council process uh, re regarding uh, the uh, automatic license plate readers. But uh, first, uh, Colin uh, Campbell Clyde. All right, thank you very much. Everybody, hear me? All right, well, they never think to look in the sushi, huh? <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm giving a talk. It's kind of an overview on the uh, National Security Agency and what we know from the Snowden uh, document leaks. So the, the NSA, we can trace it back to April of 1917. Uh, which is World War I era, the creation of the Army Cable and Telegraph Section. And this was a, a unit of the U.S. Army that was set up to deal with uh, what people in the tel intelligence community call SIGINT, or Signals Intelligence. Um, I, I, it's a perfect example of the textbook example of uh, the government uh, enacting something during wartime that they might not be able to get away with if there weren't a big war going on. So, um, and it's also um, kind of begins this, this theme that we'll see throughout the entire history of the NSA of mission creep, that uh, what started as a way to uh, you know, spy on foreign militaries. Uh, pretty soon, they're monitoring uh, Western Union telegram cables, which was the the internet of that era. Uh, so there was this was also known as uh, MI8 or Military Intelligence Branch Section Eight, and uh, it also operated under uh, what they referred to as the Black Chamber which was a building in Manhattan uh, where basically what they did was they got together uh, all the people uh, who were experts in cryptography, which is the uh, science of encoding and deciphering messages using mathematical methods. Uh, in 1929, uh, Secretary of State Harry Stimson uh, had the uh, MI8 or the Black Chamber shut down. And there's a really interesting quote uh, from him that, that came out of this. He said, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. <laughs> and I, that's a sentiment that I think we've uh, kind of lost sight of in the post 9-11 hysteria. The, uh, so then it, it sort of rises up like the phoenix again. They've, they've shut down MI8, but uh, as World War II is rolling around, the military gets some of the same people who are working on the black chamber together. They create the Signal Security Agency, which later morphed into the Air Force Security Agency. They're still doing signals intelligence, so they're uh, spying on electronic communications, <laughs> and uh, dealing a lot with codes and encipherment and trying to figure out um, how to decipher coded messages. In December of 1951, uh, President Harry Truman, who also has, of course, the distinction of being the president who dropped the atomic bomb, um, investigates the Air Force Security Agency and uh, essentially decides that there's kind of an interagency problem going on here that because it's uh, encapsulated with the, within the Air Force, it's not really communicating enough with all these other military and police agencies. So he re redesignates the AFSA, the Air Force Security Agency, as the National Security Agency, the NSA. Uh, this is National Security Intelligence uh, Directive 9 is, is the in, um, secret internal document that created the NSA. Uh, this is also the beginning of the Cold War and the rise of what 
President Eisenhower would later refer to as the military industrial complex. Now, when the NSA was first created, uh, nobody outside of the intelligence or military community really even knew, it, knew that it existed, and the joke uh, amongst the spook types who were in on this sort of thing was that the initials stand for no such agency. Uh, now they like to say that it sounds for, stands for not secret anymore. So we're going to jump ahead a few years here to the, uh, the unrest of the 1960s era. Um, after the Watergate scandal, there's an investigation into government snooping the, the church committee and Senator Frank Church. And what they uncover is an NSA program known as Minaret. Um, and it's basically what you've heard of with the Snowden stuff. It's, it's uh, mass surveillance um, specifically targeting, and this is very important here, um, specific, specifically targeting dissenters, people who are involved in the civil rights movement, uh, and people who were opposed to the war in Vietnam in a, in a public fashion. Uh, that includes Jane Fonda, uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock, Martin Luther King was spied on, um, also civil rights activist Whitney, Whitney Young, journalists like uh, Tom Wicker, the New York Times, and Washington Post humorous Art Buckwald, and it turns out, Senators Frank Church and Howard Baker. So uh, there's been a lot of speculation, it's even come up recently on the floor of Congress, is the NSA spying on Congress and other government officials? We've yet to have that um, conclusively proven by the Snowden leaks, but there's a history there that they spied on Congress before, uh, so why wouldn't they continue to spy on Congress if it's already you know, part of the DNA of the behavior of the organization? Um, a total of 1,650 citizens were targeted by Minaret. So uh, it, it, in a way that pales in comparison to the billions of people uh, who now fall under the purview of the uh, mass bulk data collection regime of the current NSA. So skip ahead again to um, the era of the war on terror post 9-11. Uh, so there's an NSA program called Thin Thread. And uh, Thin Thread could identify US phone numbers and other uh, communications data. But here's the key thing is that uh, when Thin Thread would store surveillance information in their computer servers, the, the information would be encrypted to ensure privacy. So if an NSA analyst wants to look at that data under Thin Thread, uh, he would have to go and get a court order in, in order to have that information decoded, uh, he or she, to, to have access to it. Um, thin thread, so that's um, uh, an example of, of something that was uh, developed by NSA researchers and scientists that, that is arguably actually a good model for um, doing you know, investigations of people who have criminal intent or are plotting terrorist plots without um, violating the, the privacy rights of the entire population. Um, and so, of course, they scrapped it. Oh, well. uh, Trailblazer comes along. Uh, uh, Michael Hayden, uh, who's uh, forgetting his actual title, but he's a higher up in the uh, NSA basically said, look, we want something like Thin Thread, but let's get away, let's get rid of all these privacy protections. We just want to be able to spy on everybody. So uh, this leads to William Binney and uh, Thomas Drake, who are employees of the National Security Agency, uh, going public with what's going on uh, in the net within the National Security Agency and blowing the whistle on uh, 
uh, programs like uh, Trailblazer and also a, a similar program known as Stellar Wind. Uh, Thomas Drake uh, sets the pattern for what's happened under the Obama administration with um, aggressive persecution of government whistleblowers. Uh, he's charged under the Espionage Act. Uh, he's also charged with obstructing justice and providing false information. Uh, and that's a severe, this is in 2010, that's a severe case of overreach uh, by the, uh, the executive branch uh, and the Department of Justice because uh, what ends up happening is uh, 10 of his original charges are dropped. It was a spectacular failure in the courtroom and uh, he pleads gu guilty to a minor charge that's a misdemeanor. So uh, that was an unsus unsuccessful attempt at criminalizing whistleblowers. Um, jump ahead to last year, and we have Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden works for Booz Allen Hamilton, which is a private security firm that is contracting out to the NSA. He's a computer administrator, uh, which gives him lots of access to what goes on in the computer networks. On May 20th, 2003, uh, Edward Snowden leaves behind his pretty cushy life uh, with a high paying job, living in Honolulu, uh, attractive girlfriend, uh, there's pictures of her on, her, on the internet, she's quite lovely. Um, they, uh, you got a nice life, uh, got boards a plane to Hong Kong, um, gets in touch with journalists, Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras. And uh, there's a really uh, geeky little detail that I really enjoy in this story was when, when Edward Snowden and Greenwald and Poitras first met, the, the signal that uh, the journalists would be able to uh, identify uh, and find Snowden in this uh, lounge at the hotel in Hong Kong is that he would have a Rubik's Cube on his table. So, so children of the 80s uh, uh, can get a, get a big kick out of that one. Um, June 5th, uh, Greenwald publishes the first Snowden leaks. And this has to do with the, the PRISM program. And that's a program to spy on anything that you do on Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Yahoo, YouTube, America Online, Skype, Apple, and PalTalk. So if you use any of those online applications, uh, the NSA has access to that data under the PRISM program. Um, also in that original batch of leaks, we get X Keyscore. Now X Keyscore is an uh, NSA program, it's been called Google for Spies. So if a spy wants to Google uh, your personal data, uh, they, they can or, or you know, run a search engine on it. That's, that's essentially what X Keyscore is. This is a quote from Glenn Greenwald. He says, uh, with X Keyscore, you can read anyone's email in the world, anybody you've got an email address for, any website you can watch traffic to and from it, any computer that an individual sits at, you can watch it, any laptop that you're tracking, you can follow it as it moves from place to place around the world. It's one-stop shop access to the NSA's information. Uh, the X Keyscore consists of 700 servers in approximately uh, 150 sites around the world such as U.S. military bases. Um, Snowden says, and this is a quote, his, his quote, sole motive is to quote, inform the public. That's, that's why he did it. Um, he felt that there was a, a violation of privacy happening that uh, it was in the public interest for us to be aware of it. Because there's this thing called the Fourth Amendment, which says that the right of people to be secure in their houses, persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Uh, and of course, when this was written, there was no internet. So it doesn't say email, uh, Skype chat, right? But um, houses, papers, and effects 
uh, I think it's pretty reasonable to interpret that your internet traffic would fall under that purview. Now, the Fourth Amendment was um, made in response to what were called writs of assistance. The, uh, the British who were occupying the American colonies could get a, uh, the, the soldiers could go and get a writ of assistance from a judge, and that was basically a general warrant which pretty much gave them permission to, you know, kick your door in and search just about anything they want, anyone. So uh, that's one of the things we had the American Revolution over. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we are the country that we are today, because people thought that that was an unjust system and rebelled against it. Uh, so, let's see. So more of what we know about from Edward Snowden, I'm going to give credit to the, the website Lawfare for putting together this excellent uh, running list of, of what we know from Snowden leaks. The NSA um, has developed, is working on developing software that can track airline passengers using airport Wi-Fi data. They're actually really upset over the fact that it's hard to track people uh, when they're on an airplane. So the, just the idea that you would have a few hours of your life that they can't monitor what you're doing is a, it's a big deal to the NSA. They don't like it. Um, they, they, they've invented hardware implants uh, that they can put inside a target room and use a radio transmitter to determine the position of objects, record sound in the room, and uh, monitor info displayed on uh, television screens in the room. Uh, they can insert malware, which is uh, malicious software, a computer virus, packets into Microsoft Windows uh, from a, a wireless local area network without being in the room. Uh, they could map wireless local area networks from an unmanned uh, UAV drone aircraft. Um, and put together a map of, of where all the Wi-Fi hotspots are just by flying over a city. Um, they can, they have a keystroke logger that can um, monitor what you're typing into, the com into a computer even if you're not on the internet. Uh, they have implants in uh, USB cables and circuit boards that can monitor what goes on in your computer. Uh, they can intercept data from uh, MS Windows crash reporting. So, so your computer crashes, you get the blue screen of death, it sends a message to Microsoft, here's why your computer crashed. Uh, they monitor that because that moment when your computer goes down is a really good time to see, you know, what was it that made it crash. That's a potential vulnerability that they could exploit to get into your hard drive. And, and monitor what you're doing. Uh, they send out spam email uh, with, with malware. Uh, this is, a lot of this comes from the, the recent article that was published by Jacob Applebaum, and that's a name that everybody should be aware of. Jacob, Jacob Applebaum is a software developer for the Tor project, the TOR, and if you're not using Tor, you should, because it makes it more difficult to monitor what's going on in your computer. Uh, and so he wrote an article in Der Spiegel, and there is an excellent uh, lecture that he gives at the <coughs> Chaos Computer Conference that happened just recently in Germany, and everybody should watch that lecture on YouTube because he gets into a lot more technical detail than I have the time or the inclination to get into right now.